how do you follow happiness? I, that's, it's tough. What I love most about what Tony does is Tony has the opportunity to prove me right all the time. He put money, he put a cash value on customer service. Thank you, Tony. When they sold for $985 million, I had what the value of social media customer service was, so I could check off that ROI box when clients ask me what, why we're doing all this web stuff. Trust is something very interesting to me and uh, to my co-author, Julian Smith, who I, I know is in the audience, but I couldn't find before the speech, or I would have dragged him onto the stage as well. What we learned was that we learned that the web changed the way that we do things with trust, and we wrote an ebook about it called Trust Economies, where we talked about this idea of trust as a currency, slightly different than money. We can easily understand the time is money thing, right? We understand... Uh, if I have not enough time, but I have some extra money, I can give my money to the laundry people and they can do my laundry for me and it gets it done. But there were other currencies that were of interest to us, which was trust economy. What do you do to get on the inside of things? How do you get to experiences that other people can't pay for? And that's why we started writing this book called Trust Agents. And that's a bit of what I want to talk to you about today. Trust as a currency would be the first part of that. And I'll, I'll talk about things that are about the social web, but that really aren't exactly about the tools as much as they're about the heart and the mindset that goes on behind them. Trust to us was one of the more interesting of the currencies. How do you get on the inside? How do you start to build relationships? The whole adage of nobody loves to be sold to, but everybody wants to buy was at our heart when we started talking about this. The idea we had was how do we learn what relationships do to, to bring new yield to trust? And that's where we started with, with uh, working on a book. One of the things we learned is there's something to feeling like being on the inside. Do you know that feeling that there's a difference between when you go someplace and you don't really know anybody and you're, you're nervous and you're kind of like this, and there's that thing where you're with your friends and they've brought you in and they've, they've, they've taken you to the experience and brought you to this other place where you're suddenly one of us, you're son of, suddenly one of the people who knows what's going on. I mean, coming in here off a plane ride from Atlanta in the United States to here with no sleep, I ran into Chris Hewer and Christy and Lewis and people that I knew and faces that made me feel a little more comfortable uh, switching countries like that. Being on the inside matters. The other thing we're learning is that these new tools create something that I've been calling the serendipity engine which is this whole notion that things like Twitter allow us experiences that just didn't exist before. You never look down on your cell phone and think, oh, I have 200 new contacts here, because that would be creepy. Uh, you never you know, look at Facebook and say, wow, several hundred new people just decided to friend me on Facebook and want to know about my intimate details and all my photos. You don't do that. But Twitter is the first of the tools that, uh, that shows us this idea of what a serendipity a, a engine could be. An example of this is I was going to Atlanta, as I mentioned, uh, and I arrived there a couple days ago, and I knew that one of the, uh, I knew one of the finalists in an American TV show called Top Chef was going to be, who has a restaurant in Atlanta. So I asked my Twitter network if anybody happened to just know the person. Of course they did. And even though this restaurant is a little hard to get into, they knew him very well. They happened to be his PR person. So I got a chance to have dinner uh, cooked for me by one of the finalists of the Top Chef show because somebody on Twitter knew them. These kinds of things happen all the time now with Twitter and all these tools that allow us for serendipity. And these are tools that we can use for business. They're tools that we can use for relationships. They're tools we can use for causes. It's amazing what happened in Iran uh, around the way tools like this were used for fast, velocity-filled serendipity. We do it all the time with meetups and tweetups. Everybody says, oh, everybody's over here. Let's go there and have the experience. It's a great opportunity. One of the other things we learned about, and, and Julian talks about it very eloquently, and I'll do such a poor job comparatively, is the power of a platform. And when I say this, I do not mean the technology. I mean having a, a platform upon which to build relationships and, and having a sense of a community that you can build a conversation around. Having a platform means a place where you can have your voice. It's a place where you can get, get out your information. Gary Vaynerchuk, for example, did it with Wine Library. He, he, he came to us through this video, and we got the passion of who he was, and we had the sense of 
this platform was a way for us to interact and relate. He could then take his other thoughts and his other issues to it. And then when he decided to expand out and do newer things, he moved from one platform to the next platform. That's uh, sort of what we, we're talking about in part of the book where we talk about leverage and the Archimedes principle. We never try to build from nothing. You always try to build from one piece of your strength. We, uh, we call it, you know, we think about poker or, or game play and we think of the fact that it's all chips and you can move chips from one pile to the next to a new game. What we've learned in trust and what we've learned in what the technologies that we're using so, uh, we're, we're acting as either pedestrians or business people but there's still more levers to pull inside of the systems of social networks. And one of them is to understand what leverage can do for us and how can we move information or value from one thing that we've succeeded at to the next. That's another thing that we think is worth exploring. I'll get some questions into you instead of the opposite of you asking me questions in a moment. What we learned with platforms too is should you have a platform, should you have a way to communicate, should you have a chance to build a community long before you need it, then you have the opportunity to what we call be there before the sale. The idea being, we all know that person, don't we, who wants to sell us something all the time or who's always asking us for our time or our attention. We all know that person who needs something from us every time they come to see us. Oh, hey, it's great to see you. Can you give me some more tweets for this thing? Can you promote this for me? I need 20 bucks because we're doing this charity for sick dogs in Africa. After a while, you don't want to take that person's call. You don't want to answer the email. You, you, you kind of shy away from that person at parties, and you sure wouldn't introduce that person to your friends. The whole notion of be there before the sale is try to work 12 times as hard talking about other people's things and promoting other people's things before you ever have to ask somebody for anything for yourself. I work really hard on trying to push that 12 to 1 ratio out there for more people. My goal is that more people understand that there's an opportunity to, to really build relationships, to really build leverage, but to do it at 12 times as much for the other person as you can for yourself. One of the other things we looked at was being part of everyone's network. We learned that there, uh, there's a number called Dunbar's number. Robin Dunbar uh, believes that all primates, including humans, sorry, creationists in the room, all primates, including humans, have a social network expandability of approximately 150 people. Beyond that, it deteriorates. We don't mean the software social networks, we mean people. Essentially, we can only roughly know 150 people reasonably well. Everybody outside that circle falls off. So Julian and I came up with this idea, well, what if we could become part of enough other people's social circles so that we could leverage one out of several, we could make our 150 part of your 150 and part of your 150. So what we did was we figured out if I'm friends with the realty kind of community, the people who do real estate, who's not my vertical, if I do friends with the hospitality community, if I do friends with uh, the people in um, Amsterdam, and if I can build relationships with people from all these different places, then what I do is I can build relationships that I can keep tapping into not just homogenous to where I am, not just homogenous to my industry, not just homogenous to my needs, but instead I've got a huge network because I've become part of enough people's 150 person networks that now there's a bigger yield. Does that make sense? Good, we're still with me? The other, uh, the other thing we learned is that is we have this idea called be, part, be the elbow of every deal. It's really interesting. You don't always make money on everything we do with social media. We don't always seek to. But if you could be at the elbow, if you could be the person helping connect people to other people in a way that yields them both a response, the more times you do that, that does yield eventually. That does become something of value because you're known as that person who connects people that make business happen. We're not looking at the social tools this way yet. We're still looking at how many friends we have. That's a conversation you always hear. How many followers do you have on Twitter? Who cares? How many people think you're the person making deals? That's my question. Look for numbers that mean something. Don't look for the best you know, number of followers. Look for the most active followers who will do something and take an action. Jeff Pulver, when he hired me a while ago in September of 06, the third sentence out of his mouth, I won't tell you the first two, was that you live or die by your database. And what he meant was, if you don't maintain a database, if you don't maintain your own personal connections, if you don't maintain a set of contacts that you can tap and that you can build relationships with, 
independent of the platforms that you're currently using, then you're just throwing away all your effort. If you're spending time building Twitter followings and Facebook fan groups, when the plug gets pulled on one of these, what happens next? So build your database and keep working inside of it. Keep connecting to it. We're not mechanical. We're farmers. We're stewards of humanity that have to actually keep touching this network. Do you think that once you have someone's Twitter account in your reach that suddenly you have a relationship? Do you think that once you have my email address that that translates to, sure, I'll help you with your business? Of course not. You have to build relationships. You have to actually do something with these contacts that you build. When we go to these uh, events and we shake hands and we switch out cards like we're throwing ninja shuriken at everyone, the real value is in, is there going to be a relationship after this? Are we going to still respect each other in the morning? We looked at the ideas of what we called making your own game, the idea of standing out. It seems that there's one part of this that's interesting to learn how to be on the inside, and then there's another part of this that's interesting to learn how to stand out. What we learned is that it's, it's basically, if you bought the book Blue Ocean Strategy and you learned a whole lot more about differentiation, the ideas that are in there give you a better frame of what we're talking about. What we're talking about is how did Robert Scoble be the trust agent back in the day for Microsoft? How did Cirque du Soleil decide that no animals, uh, much more expensive food, no celebrity clowns, and I can charge 18 times more a ticket than what I was getting for a plain old zoo at far less overhead? How do you look for those kinds of relations in, in your business? And I want to end with, oh, I don't know, six or seven questions that I want you to think about, that I want you to take away with you and ask them to how you're looking at the web tools that you're using and how you're looking at this social space and what this means to you. The first question is, how do we share? Ask yourself on all the things that you're doing, how are you sharing and how does your platform share? How does your business model share? How does it work all the way through the system? I think that uh, one of the most interesting things that we found in this whole use of social networks is if it's a dead end street, if it's a locked up closed environment, Nothing happens, nothing goes anywhere. But if you have a system that flows, if you can share, then everything gets bigger faster. How do we collaborate? Are you allowing information to go deeper into your system or is it sticking around the, the proprietary areas and never going out to the rest of everyone? Again, think of things as a flow. How does collaboration actually empower all the work that you're working on? How do we go from home of the home page? to being nomads. Seven or eight years ago, it was all about the site. It's not about the site anymore. It's about being where the people are. It's about having your information touching the places where the people are. It, it's building what I've been calling outposts that do lead back to your home base and building passports for the places where you don't want to build an outpost. So how do you go from having a home page to being a nomad? Not that you shouldn't have a place for them to land, but where are you going to put yourself where the people are? How do we extend experiences from the physical world to the web and back? Things like Foursquare are only really just scraping the edge of that. Brightkite was doing it before and then before that dodgeball, but there's something there, but the question is what and how deeper can it go? How can we make the web of things a little more real? We've talked about it enough, let's make it real. And how does that, ex how does that extrapolate into business? How do we wire humanity deeply? I fly a lot and I take a lot of uh, rooms in hotels and I find that there's a disparity between what the person on Twitter from Southwest Airlines does and what the person at the counter not helping me does. And I think that it's true of the hotel chains that are using the social networks, it's true of all these systems. How do we wire this humanity that we're expecting from social experiences? How do we take the human face that we've come to expect from the systems and the people that we've, we've talked to on the web? into the rest of the system and how does that information go from the person who's the Twitter contact to the call center and the customer service hub and to all of the senior team and the designers and the developers, etc. Next to last question, how do we go from being a theater where there's this, the stage, the audience, to theater in the round like unconferences and the opportunity to build 360 degree conversations? How does this work on the web? Does your site push information out or does it start a collaboration? And is collaboration the right way to go? Maybe it's not always the truth. 
And if so, then how does a 360 degree human do business? What does it mean to have that whole environment of you needing to be human and a business person or a nonprofit or whatever? How do you blend these relationships up so that you have the right mix of all of those things? This is the way I'm looking at the web. This is the way I'm looking at social media tools. These are some of the questions that we ask in the somewhat oblique way to my clients when I work with these brands like Molson and uh, Comcast and all that. What, what they're looking for isn't, should we have a Twitter account or how do we get a Facebook fan page full of people? I think they're looking how to put a human face back on business and how the web's going to help them do that. I think there's so much opportunity still left to have and I think there's still so many challenges left with going from learning how to build profiles and add numbers uh, to how to build trust agents and people who we think would be more believable, reasonable humans that we want to actually do business with. I'm Chris Brogan. Thank you so very much for your time. Thank you, Chris. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you.